Um, I'm Jack Stull. I'm the Senior Science Interpreter here at the MBA. Um, and I've been asked to give you a quick introduction to citizen science here at the MBA. So um, it's going to be quite a, a, a potted history, um, but we're going to go back and look hopefully at the last um, over 100 years of, of citizen science here at, at the MBA. OK, so I'm going to start off by telling you about something that happened in 2015 um, that really kind of made me think about the history of citizen science here at the MBA. Uh, I know some of you have heard this before, so um, apologies for that. But um, I'll begin in the summer of 2015. Um, so when holidaying on the German island of Amrun and walking on the beach, with a lot like this one, um, a retired postal worker, Marianne Winkler, found a small glass bottle. Here it is. Um, so inside the bottle, which was very well weathered, um, Frau Winkler and her husband could clearly see a, a letter, a little note, um, which instructed the finder to break it open, uh, which they did. Um, when they broke it open, they found a, a, a yellowed postcard, which instructed the finder to post it with the details of where and when it was found to a GP bidder um, at the Marine Biological Association um, in Plymouth, England. So um, the finder was promised a shilling as a reward for that, which is about five pence um, for anyone that's not familiar with pre-decimal currency in the UK. Um, being good citizens, um, the couple filled in the postcards as, as um, instructed um, and posted it back to the MBA. So I still remember when, when it arrived in the MBA, I remember coming down to reception and uh, sort of me seeing a, a scene of uh, slight bafflement and confusion um, because obviously when the, the email the standard email went out to all MBA staff trying to find out who GP bidder was and there were no responses um, and GP bidder wasn't obviously on any of the uh, the list the staff list or the visitor list for the MBA or any of the other Plymouth uh, Marine Laboratories. Um, I think it was Dave, Dave Conway who's down in reception at the time as well who uh, who finally helped us solve the, the mystery because uh, GP bidder is actually the MBA's president. The only thing was that he wasn't president at the time. Um, he was president between 1939 and 1945. Um, so thankfully, um, we've got an incredible resource in the National Marine Biological Library um, and some of the other uh, members of staff uh, at, at, at the lab as well will remember stories uh, of George Parker Bidder III. Um, the, we found out th through, through lots of research and through information that's provided by, by the library and the, the team in the library that um, he, there are loads of stories about, about him. Um, he enjoyed reading Punch magazine. Um, he bought a, a hotel over breakfast in Naples. Um, he purchased a, a research vessel for the, for the MBA and used the money, the proceeds um, from hiring it out to pay for a research fellowship at the MBA, which is still going. Um, but it also transpired that George Park, Parker Bidder also was an early pioneer of um, citizen science, marine citizen science at the MBA. So what he did was in fact release um, a thousand bottles uh, into the North Sea. He did it uh, with the aim of mapping uh, currents in the North Sea uh, and the bottles were very, very cleverly designed with a kind of trailing copper wire, um, which made them float just a few inches above the seabed. Um, this meant that they were carried along by bottom currents um, and weren't affected by, by winds. Um, importantly, uh, we learned that each one of these bottles contained a postcard exactly like the one that was found by Frau Winkler in 2015, and this helped to solve the mystery. Um, the idea of doing this survey, or this, this research, was that a bit of hope that it would provide more accurate, a more accurate indication of, of currents um, in the North Sea. Um, which it did. Um, his work uh, helped demonstrate the west to east flow in the North Sea. Um, and his data combined with studies that replicate his methods have been used to predict the movement of fish uh, and eggs and larvae, which are vital to stock management and conservation even to this day. It's a very important piece of work. Um, at the time of release, the sum of a shilling was a very valuable reward, um, which meant that over half of the bottles were actually returned, which is a very good return rate for this, this kind of study. Um, the methods that he used have been repeated the world over um, to, to track ocean currents. And although a lot of the technology that's used has, has developed since, uh, since uh, his work, um, the, 
a lot of the systems used even to this day are quite similar. In common, this, uh, this idea of a, a bounty uh, for the return of tags is still used. It's still used uh, by MBA researchers. So um, uh, research in, the David, in David Sims' group uh, use uh, tags on, on, on fish and other, other marine organisms. Um, and as you can see, the reward um, has, has increased slightly from a shilling, but the principle remains the same. So what was really incredible about the find was that the bottles were actually released between 1905 and 1906, which meant that the bottle had remained undiscovered for more than 109 years. Um, this meant that Frau Winkler had unwittingly discovered the world's oldest message in a bottle and became uh, a Guinness world record holder. Which obviously brought a lot of publicity and promotion to the MBA as well, which was, which was fantastic. Okay, so although at the time, the term hadn't been used. Um, this is a really good early example of engaging non-scientists or volunteers in the collection of scientific data. And it's what we now call citizen science. Um, these events are kind of really what opened my eyes to how long the MBA has been doing citizen science. So I've been working in citizen science at the MBA for uh, probably the last 18, 18, 19 years, but it's been obviously been going a long, a long way further back than that. Um, so I'm going to come back to uh, Frau Winkler's story, Frau Frau Winkler's story um, and the bottle at the end of my talk. But now I thought it'd be a really good, it'd be useful um, to talk to you a little bit about what science, citizen science is. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, um, and also to talk to you quickly about some of the other citizen science activities that we have got up to historically and that we're doing at the moment. Okay, to, to start with, um, I should say that the, the term citizen science, as defined previously, so this term, this definition, um, there are lots of different definitions uh, of what citizen science is. Um, I like this one because it does cover um, the wide range of activities that the terms actually come to describe. Um, there's also other words that are used to describe citizen science as well, but um, we, we, we tend to use this. Um, so although the term citizen science wasn't actually coined until the 1990s, um, as we've already seen, um, it's been going, going on a lot, a, lot, uh, a lot longer than that. Um, in fact, citizen science, scientists, um, who are people who are unpaid and without professional training, um, have been working in, in disciplines for, um, for, for, for centuries. Um, a lot of these people are, very well known early pioneers in natural scientists in natural science um, and um, a lot of them worked unpaid uh, without professional training but still made groundbreaking discoveries by looking for the answers to questions um, that they had or exploring the natural world and recording their observations um, in their free time. Examples of mass public participation in citizen science projects actually go back far further so this is a Japanese uh, cherry blossom uh, survey, which is actually actually goes back well over a thousand years, um, and you can see some of the data that's collected has been really useful in looking at changes associated with uh, with things like climate change. So it sounds obvious. Um, not all citizen science projects are the same. Um, in two thousand and nine, uh, Boni et al. Uh, describes uh, these different types of approaches, um, which we 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 kind of do activities that fall into. Um, so firstly, the, the, the methods that were used by, um, by Bidder uh, would be classified um, as contributory science, uh, citizen science. So these are projects where um, essentially scientists, professional scientists engage um, non-scientists to help in the collection of data. Um, so this would be uh, the same as people finding the bottles and returning them to the MBA. Um, collaborative citizen science, um, this is a bit Bit more interactive. Um, so this involves, um, it's more of a two-way process where um, an initial question is posed by a scientist, professional scientist. Um, citizens, volunteers help to answer those questions, um, but there is a kind of a two-way process. So there are um, often other questions raised and asked by, uh, by the, the, the volunteer participants. Co-created um, is a more interactive process where scientists um, and volunteers work together to develop a question um, and then they work together to collect data and research um, to find out the answers to those questions. Whereas citizen-led 
um, sciences as it as it sounds. It doesn't involve professional scientists, and this is a really growing sort of area um, uh, within the discipline of citizen science. So why do we do it? There's lots of reasons. Um, primarily, I mean, um, citizen science can be a really effective way to collect data over a scale and a time frame that wouldn't always be possible otherwise. Um, it helps science to focus on societal needs as well and consider questions and observations that would otherwise um, possibly not be studied. Um, it also creates a connection between people and science. So it kind of helps to what we call democratize science uh, and it brid bridges perceived barriers in the understanding of science. Um, for me, um, as someone who's involved in science communication and outreach, citizen science is a really fantastic tool for engaging people and engaging people in, in kind of real life activities to teach them about science and teach them about um, the natural world. And obviously these, these things will uh, fall into a, into a balance. Okay, to get back to the history of citizen science at the MBA, um, even before uh, GP Bidder launched his, his bottles, um, I think the benefits of citizen science have been long understood by the MBA. So ever since the MBA was, um, was first formed in 1884, uh, scientists at the lab um, relied on valuable information um, and support from the fishing community and members of the public to supplement their own research. So this kind of relationship um, was, was really entrenched from the, from the beginning. Uh, since the work of GP Bidder, I couldn't talk about citizen science without showing, showing this guy. So um, Sir Alistair Hardy uh, actually developed the, the continuous plankton recorder, which I'm sure there are people listening now who know a lot more about than me. Um, but he importantly entrusted his state-of-the-art survey equipment, not to professional scientists, but depended on teams of volunteers on cargo and passenger vessels. Um, who deployed and retrieved the equipment and essentially collected the data um, on his behalf. So the team at the, the Continuous Plankton Recorder Group um, at the MBA continue this work now um, using pretty much an unchanged design. Um, in fact, a technique which still depends on volunteers or citizen scientists, as we're calling them, um, is now undertaken by a network of laboratories globally um, to generate one of the most extensive and longest running marine biology data sets in the world. Um, and it celebrates its 90th birthday later this year. So I'm sure you'll hear a lot more about, about the work um, then. So jumping forward some, some years, um, 1967. Um, I don't know, if, um, I suspect there are people on this, uh, on this talk at the moment who were actually involved in this work. Um, the sinking of the Torrey Canyon um, in, uh, in 1967 initiated a rapid research programme which was led by scientists at the MBA on the shores of Cornwall. Um, these studies changed the way that oil spills are managed to this day um, and importantly for the purposes of our talk today um, a lot of the those outside the traditional scientific community also played vital roles in this rapid study so accounts from local people uh, were taken and recorded um, if you look in the, the book which is pictured here and in the library and um, there's more details of this there um, and uh, some local people and volunteers even undertook structured surveys uh, regular surveys in difficult to access areas which filled vital data gaps um, and in what would have been understood by, by MBA researchers otherwise. Uh, in 1998, the Marine Life Information Network, Marlin, began at the MBA. Um, and amongst other things, um, it included the, uh, the, the, sea, the Sea Life Survey. Um, it provided num numerous resources um, and information to help people get involved in recording marine life. Um, so, a lot of these, these records have been really important to helping us map species distribution um, and help to start to show changes uh, over time. Okay, other projects that we've been involved in or developed ourselves have helped to answer spe specific questions. So projects like The Sure Thing, working in association with Marklin, um, developed in 2005, uh, engaged volunteers and school groups in the collection of uh, species information, um, distribution information to help map um, range changes um, connected to warming seas and climate change. Um, we were also one of seven organisations in 2015 involved in the three year uh, Capturing Our Coast project, uh, which is also funded by HLF and involved um, over, over 5,000 participants from all over the country um, and helped to answer specific scientific questions which were posed by researchers um, in institutions around, around the country. In 2009, 
Um, so this is a, a, an area that's quite close to my heart. Um, in 2009, we ran, in partnership with the Natural History Museum in London, the first public marine coastal bioblitz in the UK. Um, for anyone not familiar with the format, um, it's a 24-hour event where experts and non-experts get together to inventory biodiversity um, in a pre-designated area. Um, it's now an annual event, um, and we've participated in or supported many other events nationally. Um, Bioblitz has actually provided an opportunity to explore under-recorded habitats um, and under-recorded species. So some examples here, um, we, uh, our first Bioblitz, a new species of tardigrade was discovered, so that's a new species to science. Um, and in our most recent Bioblitz, 80% of the records um, were actually first uh, records for the area, for the region. Um, not because they're rare or new, but often just because they're not recorded. We do also get records of non-native species um, and new arrivals as well. Um, the 24-hour nature of the event means we can record uh, interesting night records as well. So this was this was an exciting phenomenon. We we got to witness uh, bull husks uh, laying their eggs, um, pretty much in the intertidal. So very very shallow subtidal. Um, they're actually coming out of the water. Um, it also means provides great filming opportunities. And you might have seen last year's well, 2019's. Um, episode of Country Fire, which featured the fire blitz at Wembury. Okay, so um, monitoring invasive species um, and mapping their, their spread and their distribution is, lends itself very well to a citizen science approach. So um, we've, we run a number of projects which help to um, capitalise um, on that. Um, one of those projects you might have seen um, displayed at the box in Plymouth um, is Crab Watch, um, which is a project which, which uses um, people's love of crabbing um, and as a pastime um, to monitor non-native species of crabs um, and also to, to monitor um, the distribution of native uh, crabs as well. So spring coming forward even more into the more close to the present day. Um, last year we we began a project um, with Time and Tide Bell, which was actually um, looking at uh, whether community artworks like these beautiful tide bells could form a focal point for monitoring uh, change um, over time, um, environmental change over time. Um, unfortunately, after three workshops um, in uh, North Devon, Morecambe and Mablethorpe, um, where we explored questions and worked collaboratively with local communities to develop what was going to be a fantastic uh, project, lockdown happened. Um, which kind of curtailed the, the ambitions of, of the project somewhat. Um, we still developed a community species recording scheme using iNaturalist, um, and we ran a virtual bioblitz event um, in October last year, and we have kind of developed a, um, the beginnings of a, of a, of a recording community, um, hopefully now uh, more empowered to, um, to collect and use data to show um, change um, in biological communities. Um, this year, uh, we're bringing um, citizen science to the Darwin Tree of Life project. So we're working with Sea Search um, to um, basically um, working with divers uh, to collect specimens which would otherwise be inaccessible using traditional boat sampling techniques um, at, the, at the condition that, that they're required for, for the Tree of Life. Um, we hope to get started on this um, in the summer, COVID restrictions permitting. Um, and in the sort of latest news, uh, just to sort of bring us to the end, um, we've also, uh, so Dan and others working very, very hard behind the scenes to develop iNaturalist UK in partnership with the other uh, sort of big data, um, data, data providers um, in, 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 in the UK. Um, and this is, uh, I'll, I'll answer that in a minute, Rob, don't worry. It's okay, it's, it's coming soon. Um, so uh, for those who haven't used iNaturalist, it's a fantastic platform for recording um, species information. You can set up projects, it's got ID guides and it's got a fantastic community and I recommend you have a look at it, um, if not. And we're actually transferring the Sea Life Survey over, over to that platform. So um, as you can hopefully see, um, the MBA has a really long history of citizen science. That was just a very, very, very quick overview. Um, I believe that the engagement um, of those outside the tr traditional scientific community will continue to increase our profile and I think it will enhance our interest, uh, interest in our work um, and improve our outreach, as well as providing valuable scientific insights and revealing new discoveries that wouldn't otherwise be possible. So as I promised, um, in case anyone was wondering, I can see in the, the Q&A that actually they were. Um, 
Frau Winkler um, and her husband did actually get their shilling. Um, but there's another twist to the story. So um, in a cruel twist of fate, their world record for a message in the bottle was very, very short lived. And in 2018, a Perth family um, found uh, a bottle which had been adrift for 132 years after being released by a German captain uh, 600 miles off the coast of Australia. So um, that, that record was unfortunately lost, but there is still hope. Um, and in my by my calculation, um, almost half of bidders' bottles are still unaccounted for. Um, and uh, yeah, in the next 20 years, anybody uh, hopefully uh, out who finds one might be able to break the record again. So, uh, so watch this space. Okay, so thank you for listening. Um, join the MBA if you're not already a member. Um, and while you do that, I'll be happy to take any questions.